Hello, I'm Carla Gomes from Cornell University. It's a great pleasure for me to participate in this fantastic KDD Earth Day event. I'd like to thank Claire, Arindan and Yolanda for putting together this wonderful event and for inviting me to give this talk. I will be talking about computational sustainability, computing for a better world and a sustainable future. I will focus on AI for advancing scientific discovery. Before I start, I'd like to thank NSF for the tremendous support they have given us for several years. Only by having this continuous support have we been able to sustain this research. In 2008, we received a large-scale Expeditions in Computing Award that allowed us to nucleate the computational sustainability field and identify a number of core research directions, both in terms of computer science and sustainability. In 2016, we received another Expeditions in Computing Award that allowed us to establish CompassNet, a large-scale research network for expanding the horizons of computational sustainability. CompassNet involves 14 US universities as well as international universities, gov organizations, and NGOs. Over 300 faculty, students, and collaborators. You can see some of the CompassNet members in this slide. More recently, we published uh, an overview of computational sustainability research by CompassNet members in the communications of ACM. Of course, also a huge thank you to my students. They are the real bees producing fantastic research and they have contributed tremendously to the computational sustainability vision. So, what is computational sustainability? Computational sustainability is an interdisciplinary field that aims to develop computational methods for sustainable development. Sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising future generations. This notion was introduced by the United Nations in 1987 in a seminal report called Our Common Future, or the Brandland Report, led by Gro Brandland, then the Prime Minister of Norway. Our Common Future also stressed that sustainability is not only about the environment, it encompasses balancing environmental, economic, and societal needs. In fact, the ultimate goal of sustainable development is human well-being of current and future generations. More recently, in 2015, the United Nations put forward a very ambitious research agenda of 17 sustainable development goals, ranging from no poverty, no hunger, health, education, water, electricity, and economic growth for all, as well as a set of goals concerning the protection of our planet, namely climate action and the protection of all types of life on Earth. So, computational sustainability is truly an interdisciplinary endeavor and it involves very challenging research questions. In this talk, I will provide examples of computational sustainability research projects at Cornell. Here is the outline of my talk. I'll start with conservation and biodiversity, in particular bird conservation. The AI topic concerns multi-entity learning and challenge in citizen science. I will then talk about balancing environmental and socio-economic needs, in particular an exciting project concerning impacts of hydropower dam placement in the Amazon basin. The AI topic is the design of more ethical decision support systems that consider multiple criteria instead of optimizing with respect to a single criterion. I will then talk about accelerating discovery of materials for renewable energy, in particular, inferring crystal structures for materials discovery. 
from an AI perspective, this is an unsupervised constraint pattern demixing problem. And therefore, in order to obtain meaningful and interpretable solutions, we need to combine AI reasoning, constraint reasoning, and machine learning techniques. Finally, I will briefly talk about SARA. SARA stands for Scientific Autonomous Reasoning Agent for Materials Discovery. Our main computational themes are constraint optimization, dynamical models, and simulation, machine learning, and multi-agent systems and citizen science. I should stress that our sustainability projects lead to truly transformative synthesis across sustainability domains and across computer science and AI sub-areas. In fact, these problems cannot be addressed with the typical computer science and AI approaches of focusing on a little niche area. On the contrary, we really need to perform synthesis across different sub-areas. In this talk, I will highlight how, for example, it's important to combine AI reasoning with machine learning for obtaining meaningful and interpretable solutions, which is key in scientific discovery, where we also often don't have large data sets and we deal with unsupervised settings. This slide provides a different perspective. Cross-cutting computational themes across different research projects captured by subway lines. The projects correspond to subway stations and the subway lines correspond to computational themes. For example, I will talk about the black line, large-scale spatial temporal modeling and prediction for bird conservation and for studying impacts of hydropower dams in the Amazon basin. I will also give examples concerning the blue line, pattern demixing, which is important in the interpretation of spectroscopic data in material science and in the identification of animal calls from passive acoustic monitoring devices. My first topic concerns biodiversity, in particular joint species distribution modeling or multi-entity learning incorporating prior knowledge. A fundamental question in biodiversity research concerns understanding how different species are distributed across landscapes over time. To address this question, we combine data from a variety of sensors, in particular remote sensing data, but we also use a very sophisticated sensor, the human sensor. The Cornell Lab of Ornithology has a very exciting citizen science program called eBird. eBird has over 450,000 volunteer birders who have submitted over 650 million bird observations, corresponding to more than 22 million hours of field work. This is a lot of work, more than three times the time it took to build the Empire State Building. These bird observations are very precious and because we have a large volume, we actually can get a good signal. And we combine the bird observations with environmental data and using adaptive spatial and temporal machine learning models, we can relate the environmental predictors to observe patterns of occurrence and absence of the species. This animation actually shows the out output of a machine learning model. It shows the pattern of migration of the northern pintail. These models reveal the habitat preference of the birds at a very fine resolution, and in fact, they constitute the basis of the state of the bird report released officially by the Secretary of Interior. They also allow for fundamental new ways of doing conservation. As an example, Bird Returns is a program of the Nature Conservancy for protecting migratory water birds in California against drought. What you see here is the Pacific Migration Flyway. eBird models predict 
the birds migration paths and identify the target areas that need to be conserved. The Nature Conservancy program allows farmers to submit bids to keep the target rice fields flooded during the short periods of migration in California. They use combinatorial reverse auctions. The Nature Conservancy has generated over 20,000 acres of additional habitat for water birds in California. I should point out that this is a radically novel, dynamic way of doing bird conservation, and it's only possible because of the use of advanced computational methods. Let me highlight an interesting research topic that we have been pursuing, specifically joint species, species distribution models. Traditional approaches in ecology use single species distributions. However, ecologists are fully aware of species dependence. In fact, for them, it is important to capture the preference of species with respect to the environment, but also the interactions among species. They propose to use the multivariate probit model, a presence-absence model, and this model assumes an underlying multivariate Gaussian model. However, there are limitations with the state-of-the-art of multivariate probit models. In particular, the features are manually engineered, but more challenging both for, uh, from an ecology pr perspective and also from a uh, machine learning perspective, is the fact that it's hard to train the MVP model because it assumes an underlying multivariate Gaussian distribution of species interaction. So therefore, it's hard to estimate the parameters of the covariance matrix. To address this limitation, we developed an end-to-end -end deep learning model that incorporates as prior knowledge the multivariate probit model. We call it deep MVP. Deep MVP is a supervised learning model. It has an encoder that produces a two-part structure and interpretable-related space. One part captures the species preference with respect to the environment, which allows the computation of the mu for the MVP, and the second part, the interaction behavior among species, which allows the estimation of the low rank covariance matrix for the MVP. The decoder is the MVP model. As mentioned before, the key challenge is how to estimate the covariance matrix. Di Chen, and you see his picture there, is the lead author of this work, and he developed an efficient approach to approximate the computation of the covariance matrix. The idea is that we can decompose the multivariate Gaussian variable into two variables, Z, a multivariate normal with identity matrix as covariance, and W, a residual variable. We can then approximate the CDF, the cumulative distribution function of our original multi-Gaussian variable by computing the expected value of Z condition on the residual variable W. So we now have a bunch of independent variables since they are conditioned on the residual variable W and we can therefore take advantage of GPUs and parallel processing. Indeed, because of this independence property, we can sample in parallel. As a result, our model scales considerably better than previous model, models. I should also point out that typically, machine learning models such as variational autoencoders assume a diagonal covariance matrix, therefore, they assume also independence for efficient reasons, which is a key limitation for addressing these ecological questions. Deep MVP outperforms previous state-of-the-art joint species distribution models, both in terms of predictive power and scalability. 
What you see here is actually the output of the MVP, the pattern of migrations of 41 species of wobblers. In this slide, we show the 2D projection of the structure and interpretive late space. On the left, we show the embedding capturing the species preference with respect to the environment or the species habitat interactions. And on the right, we show the projection of the covariance matrix learned by DEEP MVP capturing the species interactions. DEEP MVP is a general model for multi-entity dependence learning. As a rule, whenever the students write a paper about a new approach, they need to show that it generalized to several domains. So our ICML paper showed performance improvements for other domains, namely multi-object detection for computer vision and mapping of, Amazon, of the Amazon land cover. We also apply this to fish distributions and material science problems. Junwen extended this work for a covariance-aware multi-label classification model based on DMVP and applied it to a variety of domains, birds, fish, but also BIPTEC data, yeast data, data concerning natural scenes, images, medicine reactions, and bookmarks. Xu Feng, who is a postdoc, extended the work in terms of a regression model for predicting species abundance rather than classification. This work is motivated by a collaboration with the Gulf of Maine Research Institute concerning management of fisheries. Finally, let me briefly mention a game that we developed with the Cornell Lab of Ornithology called Avication for incentivizing bias reduction in citizen science. The map on the left depicts the bird observation submitted by eBirders in the US, and it clearly shows a key problem that is prevalent in citizen science, data bias. In fact, we can easily identify the major cities in the US just by looking at this plot. To tackle this sampling problem, we developed abicaching that incentivizes birders to visit undersampled areas. We use a principal agent framework from game theory in which the principal, eBird, assigns abicaching points to undersampled areas. The eBirders see the points and they know that at the end of the season there is a lottery and they can win prizes with probability proportional to the avicaching points they collected. So this game leads to what it's called a bi-level optimization problem. On one hand, eBird has to assign the points, that is called the pricing problem, and the goal is to induce a uniform distribution in terms of the observation submitted by the eBirders this problem is actually subject to the eBird's preference and be, uh, behavior. So the second problem is called the identification problem and concerns identifying the preference of the birders. Ye Sheng developed an efficient algorithm that essentially folds the identification problem into the pricing problem. And thanks to our collaborators, we had field experience that were very successful. In a six-month period, we showed that we could shift 20% of the bird observations to undersampled areas. These experiments were conducted in Ithaca. Avicaching is now being used in other parts of the US. By the way, I should mention that Avicaching is the real version of the Pokemon Go. My next topic concerns socioeconomic impacts of hydropower dam placement in the Amazon basin. From an AI perspective, this is a multi-objective decision-making problem, and in particular, we are interested in designing more ethical AI decision support systems that consider a variety of criteria instead of 
optimizing only with respect to energy. In the last 50 years, there has been a proliferation of hydropower dams in the Amazon basin. I should say, the real Amazon. In fact, more than 200 dams have already been built or are under construction. And they have more than 300 dams planned or proposed for the near future. The main reason for constructing a hydropower dam is obviously the production of energy. However, when evaluating alternative placement of dams, we have also to consider the different ecosystem service that river networks provide. In fact, dams fragment rivers and therefore they affect negatively a variety of ecosystem service provided by rivers, such as fish production, transportation and navigation, and sediment production. Dams can even lead to the production of greenhouse gases due to the fact that they can flood large areas of land, which can lead to the decomposition of organic matter with the release of methane. So, from a computational perspective, this is a multi-objective optimization problem and we are interested in computing the Pareto frontier. What is the Pareto frontier? The Pareto frontier captures the trade-offs with respect to the different objectives of the different solutions of dam portfolios. Here is a simple example of a Pareto frontier. In this plot, the x-axis represents energy and the y-axis represents ecological value. If we don't build any dams, we keep all the ecological value. On the other hand, if we build lots of dams, we destroy all the ecological value. This solution is in between. And in fact, this solution has the same energy output, but a much higher ecological value than this other solution. So, this solution is dominated by the one on the Pareto frontier. On the left-hand side, we see two dam configurations with similar hydropower yields, but different degrees of river connectivity. The right configuration is better from the point of view of river connectivity since it builds the dams away from the mouth of the river. So the river is not as fragmented as the configuration on the left hand side. In our work, we are developing algorithms for computing the Pareto frontier, both the exact Pareto frontier, but also efficient approximations, and in particular, we are developing fully polynomial time approximation schemes for computing the Pareto frontier. We actually have a dynamic programming-based algorithm that uses a very fast algorithm for eliminating dominated solutions that runs in order n log n. To give you an example, we can compute the approximate the Pareto frontier with 99.9% uh, guarantee for three criteria in a question of minutes. We are also exploiting hybrid strategies because this problem is truly exponentially in the number of criteria. Therefore, it is important to find fast uh, solutions of uh, computing the, the Pareto frontier. In this slide, we illustrate the cost of inefficient planning. This curve represents the Pareto frontier, considering all the dams, as if we had planned them before building a single one. This is the point we are at, given the, the dams that have been already built. 
we can see the foregone environmental benefits. For this amount of energy, we could have had a much higher ecological value in terms of river connectivity. Alternatively, for this river connectivity, we could produce much more energy. This is the Pareto frontier going for, forward. Let me highlight that we are considering many other criteria, energy, sediment, seismic risk, biodiversity, in particular fish, greenhouse gases, uh, indigenous populations affected, etc. Also, we have a very large team of collaborators, including biologists, ecologists, hydrologists, and social scientists. Here we show the Pareto frontier with respect to energy and greenhouse gases. Not because we want to minimize greenhouse gas emissions on the left axis, the Pareto frontier has a different shape, the lower the better. This work appeared recently in Nature Communications. The lead author is our postdoc, Rafael Dalmeida. You see his picture here. We consider two different time horizons. On the left, a 20-year time horizon, and on the right, a 100-year time horizon. A key point with this work is that if we don't plan the dams properly, we can actually end up with solutions that are dirtier than coal. You see these purple uh, lines. And this happens because, as I mentioned before, dams can lead to the generation of greenhouse gases since they can flood very large areas that lead to the decomposition of organic matter resulting in the release of methane. As a summary, this slide shows the Pareto frontier with respect to different criteria. On the left, top left, we see river connectivity. On the right, sediment production, fish biodiversity, and at the bottom, greenhouse gas emissions and degree of regulation of the river. We see that we lost the most ecological value in terms of river connectivity and biodiversity, fish biodiversity. In other words, the gap between the ideal Pareto frontier and the current Pareto frontier is the largest for connectivity and fish biodiversity. My final topic is accelerating discovery of clean energy materials, in particular fuel cells and solar fuels. The AI topic is unsupervised pattern demixing, and I will talk about an exciting problem concerning inferring crystal structures from synchrotron X-ray data. This is a scientific domain, and because we have a, a few data points, unlabeled data points, we really need to combine machine learning techniques with AI reasoning techniques, constraint reasoning techniques, to uh, be able to uh, inject prior knowledge concerning thermodynamic rules. In fact, we developed a new uh, uh, formalism, uh, a framework that we call uh, deep reasoning nets. Essentially, we combine logical and constraint reasoning with deep learning. In 2010, the Obama administration launched the Materials Genome Initiative with the goal of accelerating the pace of discovery of new materials and reduce the cost of discovery of materials. Materials discovery is a very exciting research area for AI. We are collaborating with material science at Cornell and at Caltech, and in particular, they are working on accelerating discovery of solar fuels or materials for solar fuels and fuel cells. Solar fuels are very promising because, contrarily to, let's say, solar panels, 
solar fuels can be stored and used later. So they are not dependent on the intermittence of solar energy. Very briefly, let me give you a perspective of uh, uh, an area called high throughput materials discovery. I should actually say that uh, it's also called combinatorial materials discovery, and in fact, the the name in particular, the word combinatorial, attract me to this area. So, but in high throughput materials discovery, material science can synthesize thousands of materials a day using a technique called co-sputtering. This is like atomic spray painting. They can also characterize thousands of materials a day using, for example, synchrotron-based X-ray diffraction. The key challenge is how to infer the crystal structures of the materials based on the X-ray diffraction patterns. And this task is main, mainly a manual task requiring expert knowledge. And in fact, they can only analyze a few systems a year. So that is really the uh, analysis and the uh, inference of crystal structures from uh, uh, X-ray diffraction data. That is really the key bottleneck of high throughput materials discovery. Here we show a representation of a chemical system in which three elements, A, say gold, B, let's say silver and C, bronze, were co-sputtered. You see here a sample of an X-ray diffraction pattern obtained with this proportion of uh, uh, each element. And what we see here is the uh, spectrogram of the X-ray diffraction pattern. Here is, we have another uh, spectrogram for another data point, and here we have another data point. And what uh, I want to highlight, basically these data points were extracted from different uh, areas, and you can see that the middle point, the spectrogram of the middle point, is really a combination of the spectrograms of the other two points. In fact, we have uh, in this uh, example, what we call three crystal phases, where we have crystal at the bottom, delta, in the middle we have uh, gamma and delta, and at the top we have the phase gamma. So this system has four pure crystal phases, alpha, beta, delta and gamma and it has a total of six crystal phase fields because in addition to the pure phases it has two mixed phases one with alpha and beta the other one with the gamma and delta so our crystal phase mapping problem is an unsupervised pattern mixing problem the input is a collection of XRD patterns, and the output comprises M phase regions, K pure regions, and M minus K mixed regions. And for each pure phase, we also want to output the XRD pattern characterizing that phase. Note that the output also has to satisfy additional physical requirements, namely thermodynamic rules. These rules state facts such as the phase regions and phase fields have to be connected components, but they also involve other logical rules, for example, cardinality rules, or even rules, conditional rules saying if there's a line, which means that the two elements are substituting each other, which is reflected by the shifting of the spectrogram, then the system loses a degree of freedom. So, you know, because of the fact that this problem is unsupervised, we don't have labeled data, and in fact, we only have around, you know, 300 data points, and we need to make sure that 
the resulting uh, uh, crystal structure phases uh, obey thermodynamic rules, this problem is quite challenging for the state of the art of machine learning. And we really need to combine uh, logical and constraint reasoning with uh, machine learning techniques to uh, 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 interpret the, the uh, XRD patterns in a meaningful way. As I mentioned before, I have a rule that states that when we develop a new framework for a particular problem, in this case, unsupervised pattern demixing, we have to show that we can apply the same framework to other similar tasks. In this case, since understanding crystal structure phase mapping involves complex scientific background knowledge, it's even more important to have another task that is easier to understand. So we made up another demixing task that we call multi-amnist sudoku that is easier to understand. Given a set of image containing mixed digits, we want to demix the digits without having access to label data for training the algorithm, but having the prior knowledge that the data come from two overlapping sudokus and therefore assuming the sudoku rules. Here we have two 4x4 four four overlapping sudokus. And here you have the demixed sudokus. Examples of other demixing problems are identifying elephant calls or bird calls or instruments from audio recordings. Topic in modeling is another example of a pattern demixing problem. In topic modeling, we are given a set of documents and we want to identify the key topics underlying the documents. We can see this problem as a demixing task. The constraints here are typically soft, as opposed to the hard constraints that we have in the demixing of sudokus or in crystal phase mapping. I already alluded to the computational challenge of crystal structure phase mapping. It is an unsupervised learning task, so we don't really have uh, uh, label data to train on. And we also have to deal with the noise and the fact that often we have incomplete data. So the standard ML techniques really fail to capture the underlying physics of the constraints. So what's required in this case is really to use symbolic AI to use a rich set of combinatorial constraints to capture the physics of the phenomena. And for that, we have to actually do this computational synthesis and integrate machine learning techniques with logical constraint reasoning and sampling techniques so that we are able to interpret the uh, uh, phase maps in a meaningful way. To solve these types of challenging tasks, we develop deep reasoning nets, which seamlessly integrate logical and constraint reasoning into deep learning. Even though this framework was truly motivated by crystal phase mapping, I illustrated it here for the multi-amnist pseudo problem. Deep reasoning nets are a customizable end-to-end -end framework comprising an encoder, typically a neural network that produces a two-part interpretable structural latent space. For the Sudoku application, it captures the probability of each digit as well as the shape of each digit. The interpret structure latent space also allows the encoding of Sudoku constraints as entropy-based functions. Prior knowledge also include, includes digit prototypes, which are used to pre-train and build the decoder, a conditional GAN. An overall objective combines response from the generative decoder and the reasoning module and is optimized using a variant of stochastic gradient descent that we call constraint-aware stochastic gradient descent and backpropagation. 
For the Sudoku task, DRNet outperforms state-of-the-art supervised methods, namely CapsuleNet and ResNet, but more importantly, DRNet solved previously unsolved challenging chemical systems that led to the discovery of new solar fuels materials. More generally, our research has led to the discovery of a variety of solar light materials. It was featured as the cover article of AI magazine and also a cover article of the uh, ACS Combinatorial Science, which is a journal in material science, and it was also the Editor's Choice Award. It also received an Innovative AI Award. Finally, let me briefly mention SARA. SARA stands for Scientific Autonomous Reason Agent, and it is an ambitious project for integrating materials experiment, theory, and computation. It involves a group of material science from Cornell, Caltech, um, Northwestern, and the University of Colorado Boulder, and myself and Bart Selma as computer scientists. SARA will encapsulate key components of the scientific method, from hypothesis generation to planning and designing of the experiments, to the interpretation and analysis of the experience with the production of new knowledge. For example, crystal structure phase mapping is a key module in SARA. SARA integrates a variety of AI techniques, search, constraint reasoning, planning, machine learning, and human-computer interaction. Let me now wrap up. I talked about a variety of computational sustainability projects, highlighting several cross-cutting computational themes. In particular, I talked about multi-entity learning for joint species distributions, the computation of the Pareto frontier for studying impacts of dam placement in the Amazon basin, and unsupervised demixing for crystal structure mapping in materials discovery. All these problems are quite general and can be applied in a variety of settings. In summary, computational sustainability aims to advance computational methods to help balance environmental, economic, and societal needs for sustainable development. Computational sustainability is a two-way street. On one hand, we can inject computational thinking, providing new insights, methodologies, and solutions to sustainability problems. On the other hand, sustainability Questions lead to foundational contributions to computer science by exposing computer science to new challenging problems and new formalisms and concepts from other disciplines and leading to new cross-cutting problems in computer science. More importantly, computational sustainability can have tremendous societal impact. Thank you.